So now I have the opportunity to present today's speaker. One of uh, the duties of a law school dean is to represent the law school throughout the legal community. This more often than not means service on many committees and attendance at bar meetings, both those that serve food and those that don't. And quite frankly, I haven't decided which I prefer. <laughs> there, however, is a significant benefit to participating in bar activities, meeting many of Georgia's lawyers. This is a devoted group of individuals who put service to others ahead of some of their own personal interests. No matter how select a coterie of lawyers is, a few always stand out above the rest. Fortunately for me, I met one of them at a meeting I attended last year. When she began her presentation, my attention was focused more on my first taste of true Southern barbecue than her speech. Shortly, however, I heard a few words that caught my attention. And the more I listened, the greater my interest grew. Here was a woman not talking about lawyers could just do better, but rather how they could dramatically change the lives of others. Her message was quite simple. We are not doing enough. And she ex proceeded to explain why. On a screen, she projected a map of the state of Georgia that had county boundary lines clearly marked. Counties had different colors. She pointed to a group of identically colored counties and said, there are not any lawyers in these counties. We have to change that. I found this impossible to believe. Entire counties without easy access to legal services. But this woman had a plan to change that. And in that moment, I understood why she was a leader in our profession. Anyone familiar with the speaker knows of her accomplishments over the years. Indeed, she has received numerous honors, including induction into the Gate City Association's Hall of Fame, receipt of the Lee Award Sears Service to the Profession Award from the Georgia Association of Black Women Attorneys, the Eleanor Rowell Green Trails, Trailblazer Award from Emory Law School, and the Phoenix Award from the Mayor of Atlanta. She has served on the Hosea Feed the Hungry's Board of Directors as Parliamentarian of Atlanta Planning Advisory Board, Chair of Georgia's State Bar Real Property Law Section on the Board of Governors of the State of the Georgia Bar and more recently on its executive committee. She now leads that organization. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to invite to the podium the first African-American president of the State Bar of Georgia, Patrice Perkins Hooker. It's all yours, it's all yours, and I'll be back to get you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Dean Morris and the faculty of John Marshall for inviting me to give you this commencement address. You ought to know that it's a really big deal when the faculty has to choose somebody to speak to this group. And I am very honored that you gave me the opportunity to address you today. I am blessed to have with me um, my husband of over 36 years and my father, Albert Perkins, here to support me during this speech. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. I want to pick up on something that the dean uh, tried to do, but you all kind of did it half-heartedly. And I want to encourage you a little, just to take a little diff different spin on this. And that is, I wanted to start my remarks by letting you know that I think that you really ought to pay a lot more attention to the people who got you here. You did not just graduate from law school without a tremendous support group. And I wanted all of the people who are here who are 
parents, grandparents, wives, significant others, siblings, children, nieces, nephews, and friends of the graduate to stand. You all stand and be recognized, come on. And then graduates, you give them a round of applause while you sit. <laughs> Thank you. These are the people who are your village and these are the people in the community who have helped you be successful. So never, ever forget them. Most of you would not be here today if it, not, if it wasn't for the support of your family. And although you're graduating from law school and you're all of that in a bag of chips, you are going back to a family and a community who has nurtured and sustained you and they are waiting for a return of their investment in you. <laughs> and guess what? I'm not talking about a monetary return. I am talking about they are hoping that you make something of yourself so that they can be proud of you. They expect you to make a difference in the world, and you can. I am so very proud of each and every one of you. You have studied hard, you have applied yourself, you have stayed up late, you have worked while attending school to make a way to get through school, you have missed family events, you did not take time off to celebrate holidays, nor did you get a chance to party that much with your friends just so that you could be prepared for class and take full advantage of your educational opportunities. You have proved your proficiency in your knowledge of law to such an extent that this fine institution has deemed you worthy to go forward and be a lawyer. That is, once you pass the bar exam. <laughs> Today, you are receiving the reward for your sacrifices and you are to be commended and congratulated. Enjoy this moment. You are about to enter a very noble profession. In fact, this profession was one of the three most noblest professions in our community. The first one was the, were ministers, and those people healed the soul. The second profession was those of doctors and physicians, and they healed the body. And the third is the category to which you are going to eventually become a member, and those are lawyers whose purpose is to heal the community. But somewhere along the way, lawyers have ceased to be universally regarded as a noble profession. One, our perception in the community, frankly, has been tainted by the virtue of greed, corruption, abuse of power, and criminal actions of a few bad lawyers. We have heard several of our members referred to as ambulance chasers, money grubbers, blood suckers, mouthpieces, and silk suits. None of these references should be viewed as terms of endearment. We have had too many members in our profession chase after high paying jobs and money rather than justice and service to mankind. You are graduating and you're in transition. You're moving forward with your degree into a new phase of your life. My question to you is what are you going to do with your degree to make the world a better place? Several of you have heard me repeat my motto over and over again, again this year in several speeches. And, and I'm going to ask those of you today as well, or tell you today as well, to those of you whom much is given, much is expected. Now, this is not my idea. It actually originates from the Bible. Luke 12, 48 says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. I want you to know that the practice of law is not a right. You graduate, it means you get a chance to practice, no. It is a privilege in our state, which is granted to you once you pass the bar exam 
and pay your dues. <laughs> Along with this privilege comes a moral obligation to ensure that all citizens of this great state are provided justice and reasonable access to legal services. I know that all of you are aware as a law school graduate that you have been given much. You all graduated from college. You've all had a chance to have opportunities and knowledge that 17-year-old Trayvon Martin from Sanford, Florida never lived long enough to experience. His life was tragically ended by a local vigilante trying to protect his community from criminals. You have had years of exposure to the principles of law upon which our society was created. Those principles include concepts of you are innocent until you're proven guilty and all people are entitled to equal justice under the law. 50-year-old Walter Scott from Charleston, South Carolina never had your training and he will never get the opportunity. He was killed by a police officer who said that he felt threatened by Mr. Scott. It was only after the video taken by a witness emerged that showed the gruesome facts about Mr. Scott's death. 19-year-old Renisha McBride from Detroit, Michigan did not think she was at risk of losing her life when she knocked on the door of a stranger and asked for help after a car accident. 22-year-old Willie Otis Williams was convicted in ra of rape in Georgia in 1985 based solely on the testimony of two female eyewitnesses. He served 22 years in jail for this crime and was finally exonerated in 2007 through DNA evidence as a part of the work of the Georgia Innocence Project. You have spent three years in an, environment, in an environment where debate and civil discourse were nurtured and encouraged. And several of you were successful in moot court, mock trial, and debate teams because of this training. The residents of Ferguson, Missouri could have used people with skills like you to advocate for justice without burning down their neighborhoods. Our world is in trouble, and you represent the future solutions to these problems. It's your time to be prepared to join the front lines of the fight for civil and human rights. It's your time to be a banner carrier for the least of these so that everyone, regardless of race, ethnicity, religious preference, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, disability, or veteran status is afforded the same precious rights that you studied for three years. Our society requires that the type of incidents that I described this afternoon do not continue to happen. It is not okay. These types of affronts to our justice system threaten to destabilize our very way of life. If citizens do not believe that they will be treated fairly by our justice system, they will not subject themselves to it, and they will not abide by the rules that we need to govern society. The result will be anarchy, chaos, and confusion. How would law and order be maintained if people's liberties are routinely denied and trampled upon. The images that we are seeing today remind me of some of the footage from the civil rights movements of the 60s. History reflects that when it is only when the consciences of middle class white Americans were shocked by the scenes of the children being hosed and chased by Sheriff Bull Connor and his dogs that the legislators and elected officials heard from people and said, we've got to do a change. These conscientious citizens wanted the situation to be resolved and the coverage to stop bombarding them on their television shows after dinner. They called for an end to the injustices and inequities based solely on race. Their cries, not the loss of African-American lives and livelihoods or of African-American cries, resulted in the 1964 Civil Rights Act. 
We are living through a time when history is repeating itself and now the call is for a way to once again address racial injustices. In this time, but, but this time it's in our law enforcement and our legal systems. Now I wanna be real clear. I don't want all of you to become civil rights and human rights attorneys. But I do expect all of you to care about and support efforts to secure justice and fairness for everyone. I am a corporate and commercial real estate attorney. I've also practiced taxation and probate law. However, I have cared about young people who were being subjected to sex trafficking, and I volunteered to create a nonprofit entity called the Juvenile Justice Fund, which is now called Youth Speaks, and served as its chair for eight years. This organization developed systemic solutions to address the criminalization of sexually exploited people under the age of 16. We work to educate police force members, police forces, and school systems on how to recognize and address this issue. Our Coalition to End Adolescent Sexual Exploitation, or CEASE as it's called now, passed laws to change the system. These laws made pimps who profited economically from the prostitution of young people be guilty of felonies rather than being slapped on the wrist with a $500 fine, given a misdemeanor, and put back on the street to find somebody else. As a result of these efforts, we were able to prosecute the 12 of the worst offenders, and each of them received 12 years to serve for their actions. We also worked to rehabilitate the young women in a safe home environment where they were provided treatment for the emotional scars that they had sustained by virtue of their sexual exploitation. The house was called Angela's House. This was a labor of love because of my passion to end the sexual abuse of children for the economic benefit of adults. I volunteered for, 12, for 14 years as co-chair of the Commission on the Children on the Courts to investigate what was happening with children in the justice, juvenile justice system and how we could improve it. From that commission's work, the State Bar of Georgia and Georgia Appleseed worked to change the um, make changes to the juvenile code of Georgia. In fact, we just decided to rewrite the whole code. It all needed to be rethought. I also cared enough about the plight of poor people in need that I volunteered for over 12 years with Hosea Feed the Hungry and empowered that organization to move forward with their mission. Confident in the fact that their organizational structure was intact, that their 501c3 status was preserved, and that the property that they had their uh, headquarters on still had tax-exempt status. You see, there are ways in which you can use your legal skills to help others that may not take you out of your comfort zone and, or to the front line of a protest. I have never been on a picket line or walked as a protester. But when young people were arrested by the droves during Freaknik, a spring activity that was popular with African-American college students in the 19, late 1990s, I volunteered to represent the students in municipal court. Why? Because they were young and did stupid things as young people often do. I didn't want them to spend the rest of their life with a record that reflected a fine or jail sentence for doing something that wasn't smart. I became a guide through the legal system and supported my brothers and sisters who did not know the language or how to navigate these waters. I represented several students and worked out community service deals for all of them, which allowed their charges to be dismissed upon the completion of their community service. I could have been worried about how much money I could have charged them and whether or not I was getting anything for the time that I spent for the days I spent down in municipal court. But I never thought about that. They needed help. I had the skills many more than they had. <laughs> I wasn't the best criminal lawyer, but I worked. I, I do in a pinch. I knew that I had been granted blessings and privileges, and I was obligated as a person who lives on this earth to provide service and to help others. Marion Wright Edelman coined the phrase that service is the rent we pay for the space that we occupy on the earth. 
I try to agree with that philosophy. And I, well, I do agree with a lot of philosophy. I tried to live by it. I tell you my story, not because I'm all of that in a bag of chips. I'm just like you. I'm not different, I'm not unique, and I'm not special. I went to college and decided, like many of you, to take on a legal education and to become a lawyer to help people. Sure, I hoped that I would make enough money to make a good living, but I didn't go to law school to be a millionaire. And if you did, you missed the purpose. I chose to work to make a difference in the world, and you can too. In fact, I personally am counting on you to do so. I want you to find that special area that you are passionate about and that something other than the law, something that you do just because it makes you feel good. It could be arts, it could be music, it could be education, it could be working for abused children, it could be working with veterans, senior citizens. It could be working to address the problems experienced by young African-American males in the justice system. Wherever you find your passion, invest your time, your talents, and your treasure. Go to an elementary school, read to a third grader, become a big brother or a big sister, join an arts council or board, volunteer to provide legal assistance to military servicemen and veterans in one of the numerous programs that are there to assist them. Volunteer to work with senior citizens organizations and host a will clinic or elder rights workshop, or just deliver a meal to someone who never has sees anybody once a week and sit down and talk to them. Volunteer with the local a L ACLU or the NAACP and become a part of the brain trust that is seeking solutions to the impact on our society of race in the justice system. I hope by now you get my point, All right? It's like the Nike ad, just do it. Do something. Do something to give back such that the folks here will feel that their investment in you has not been in vain. Care about our chosen profession enough to go out and be a shining example of a caring, concerned lawyer rather than the stereotypical money-grubbing egotistical, selfish, self-centered person that people in our society have become to think that's what a lawyer is. I'm not that type of lawyer, and neither are you. I believe you have all of the skills. I believe you have the talent. I believe you have the ambition and the training to change the world. But do you care enough can I count on you to be a part of the solution? I hope so, because you're all we have to protect the future. Congratulations and best wishes. President Perkins, Patrice, Patrice, the message has been delivered. I'm sure it's been heard. It, I want to add something to this and say, in recognition of your outstanding contributions to the legal profession, demonstrated commitment to the principle that all deserve access to the legal system and dedication to Atlanta's John Marshall Law School's core values relating to equal justice for all. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Directors, it is my honor to award you Atlanta's John Marshall's Honorary Doctor of Laws degree. Wow. With all privileges <laughs> pertaining thereto. Thank you. <laughs>